If you live in the English-speaking world, it's almost certain that you've heard someone bring up something called the Inquisition. This refers to organized efforts of Christian church leaders to purge heresy in their societies. It was most prevalent and organized in the Middle Ages. Along with the Crusades, the Inquisition is a favorite target of those looking to paint Christian history in a bad light. This narrative has been reinforced by films, books, and even video games. Films like History of the World Part 1 show the Inquisition as a bunch of wacky priests torturing Jews. Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Pit and the Pendulum, depicts an Inquisition victim being executed by a gigantic pendulum. We should immediately note that both of these depictions of the Inquisition feature torture devices that never actually existed. The Iron Maiden is a total myth, as are a lot of the devices shown in this scene. As for pendulums, there's zero evidence such things were ever used for torture. But regardless of how inaccurate this kind of media is, it both reflects and reinforces popular misunderstandings about the Inquisition. It's become amazing how out of touch this perception is with the conclusions of actual historians. The Inquisition today is mostly brought up for Christian bashing, by people with an incentive to demonize the religion. But it didn't actually start with them. These narratives go all the way back to 1500s England. During England's transition from Catholic to Protestant, anti-Inquisition propaganda was used to denounce both Catholicism and England's main rival, Spain. Similar claims were later made in the 17 and 1800s by anti-clerical and anti-Christian historians. Since then, many unsuspecting people treated those views as truth despite them being largely debunked by modern research. And today, many accept anti-Inquisition narratives because they lack the proper knowledge to argue otherwise. This video will set the record straight. I'll be addressing the biggest points surrounding the Inquisition. The history of Inquisitions, the number of people killed, the methods used by Inquisitors, and whether the concept of Inquisition itself is against Christianity. Critics make many assertions that are misguided at best or factually wrong at worst. In this video, you'll be finding out why the Inquisition was justified and important to Christianity's integrity as a religion. After this, you'll know what to say when someone brings up the Inquisition. We should begin by defining exactly what an Inquisition is. The word Inquisition comes from the old French word for inquiry or investigation. In the Christian sense, it refers to efforts to combat heresy, or false teachings that violate Christian orthodoxy. If you can't imagine why policing heresy would be necessary, I invite you to look at what some so-called Christians say in the name of God in our current time. I apologize for what you're about to see, but it's necessary. I believe in the non-binary God, whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads. Jesus is black. We could also say Jesus is gay. And that means that there will be more drag preachers. Amen? Now that you have an idea of what heresy looks and sounds like, let's talk a bit about the history of Inquisitions. Through Christian history, there were several different official Inquisitions, but Inquisition of some form or another has always been part of Christianity. There's no time period you could go to where there wasn't some form of inquisition within the Christian church. From the beginning, the church had to confront people who presented their beliefs as Christian when what they said or did contradicted the faith passed down from the apostles. The early church leadership had to combat many heresies. Early accounts in the Bible and Paul's letters show the young church correcting those who falsely represented the faith. Church fathers and early theologians wrote extensively against the first heresies their communities faced, such as Gnosticism. It was in response to such heresies that the famous book Against Heresies was written by St. Irenaeus in 180 AD. The church rightfully considered her duty to educate and guide all the baptized. It should be obvious that allowing false Christian teachings to run rampant would have been a death sentence for early Christianity. Without authority and order, no one would have been able to define what Christianity even is. Imagine being a Roman citizen and hearing 10 different versions of Christianity. It would make it much more confusing and harder to convert. In those days, the church responded to false teachings with denunciation and, if persistent, expulsion from the community. Priests and church leaders found guilty of spreading false doctrine were subject to flogging and imprisonment. 
these early disorganized inquisitions brought order to what could have been chaos. As Christianity became the faith of the Roman Empire and the European kingdoms, the faith became understood as the fundamental, unifying principle of culture. To step outside the faith was viewed as a violation of Christian unity and a denial of the correct ordering of the world. The popular community, the clergy, and the secular authorities all agreed on these principles. Going into the Middle Ages, inquisitions carried on as ecclesial investigations. They were investigations and trials conducted by the church through the local bishop or a member of a religious order. These inquisitions became very active in times of serious, widespread heresy that needed to be addressed. As the church became more powerful and tens of millions of people looked to it for guidance, new, more organized methods of inquisition became necessary. This led to new inquisitorial courts. Judges were required to be of impeachable reputation, distinguished for virtue and wisdom, and masters of theology. An inquisitor was thus one of the most educated and respectable people you could find in Europe during the Middle Ages. These courts would revolutionize concepts of due process and evidence gathering that are still used today. Inquisitions typically involved a judicial process that aimed at confession and conversion. Their goal was to secure a person's repentance for heretical views and to stop them from engaging in such acts. If the guilty persisted, he would be turned over to the secular authorities. In other words, the church conducted investigations and trials while punishment was left to the civil state. The first large, organized inquisition came in 1184 in France as a response to the Catharist heresy. This was known as the Medieval Inquisition. Now, to be clear, Catharism was not some kind of early Protestantism or anything like that. It was essentially its own new religion. It blended together Gnosticism, which claimed to have a secret source of religious knowledge, and Manichaeism, which taught that matter is evil. The Catharists believed in two gods the good God of the New Testament, and the evil God of the Old Testament. Following their belief that the material world is evil, they engaged in ritualistic suicide, rejected procreation, and refused to take oaths. Now obviously, in a feudal society, this meant they opposed all government authority. Because of this, Catharism was both a moral and political danger. The original church response to the Cathars was persuasion through dialogue. But the Cathars continued to engage in violent, openly rebellious acts, and even assassinated a papal diplomat. All of this led Pope Innocent III, who had been favorable to peaceful dialogue, to finally call on French leaders to launch a crusade to defeat Catharism once and for all. Although the war was successful in breaking Catharism's power, it was much more chaotic and deadly than what the Pope wanted, with thousands of innocent people being caught in the crossfire. After this, the church decided that inquisitions had to become even more organized and less dependent on secular powers. They also had to stop heresy preemptively before it could get out of control. The newly created Franciscan and Dominican orders began to take a leading role in the process. Another inquisition was the Roman Inquisition, started in 1542. This was the most professional inquisition yet, as it was directly controlled by the papacy. Its main goal was to protect the Catholic faith from the ongoing Protestant Reformation, but it also sought to crack down on problems within the church itself. During this time, the church really wanted to clean up its own house and get rid of abuses that fueled its critics. Corrupt Catholic clergy became popular targets of this inquisition. One could actually argue that the Protestant Reformation itself was a product of the medieval inquisition being too lax, not too strict. In the words of the writer Robert P. Lockwood, in many Inquisition courts, a major focus was on clergy living dissolute lifestyles rather than laity. Now, of course, the most famous Inquisition was the Spanish Inquisition, started in 1478. It was a state institution started to identify Jews and Muslims who pretended to convert to Christianity while secretly practicing their former religion. These were known as conversos and moriscos. Besides this goal, the Spanish Inquisition also played the role of clearing the names of people falsely accused of being heretics. It was the most widespread Inquisition because it pursued not only heretics, but also those accused of sorcery, sodomy, polygamy, and usury. It has the worst reputation, but as you'll find out, it doesn't deserve it. The Spanish Inquisition actually enjoyed widespread popular support. It was so popular that when an inquisitor was almost assassinated by a group of conversos in the late 1400s, the townspeople rioted and killed the would-be assassins. 
The treatment of Muslims and Jews in Spain reflected Spain's difficult history and struggle for existence through the centuries. Due to constant wars for survival, the Spanish perceived Muslims, and eventually Jews as well, as dangerous groups that couldn't be trusted in their society. It should be noted that different Catholic societies had their own views on this issue. For example, some Catholic kingdoms permitted Jews a degree of autonomy as long as they submitted to the state and didn't meddle in the broader Christian society. So let's get right down to it. How many people were killed during all the Inquisitions? Before giving any numbers, I should point out that there was always strong disagreement within the church over whether death could ever be a valid sentence for heresy, and there were strong arguments on both sides of the issue. Harsh penalties for heretics were ultimately pushed for by kings and princes, since heresy became increasingly tied to treason and anarchy. In any case, some memes that circulate on the internet claim that 50 to 90 million people were executed. This number is absurd if you know anything about European demographics and has no basis in reality or history. The dreaded Spanish Inquisition sentenced to death, wait for it, 3,000 to 5,000 people, about 2.7% of all cases. And that's over the course of several centuries. Not exactly the murder factory churning out dead bodies that it's often portrayed as in media. Historian Henry Common, an expert on the Spanish Inquisition, wrote, we can, in all probability, accept the estimate, made on the basis of available documentation, that a maximum of 3,000 persons may have suffered death during the entire history of the tribunal. When you add up the whole Inquisition, covering all of Western and Central Europe, historians estimate that around 10,000 to 30,000 were sentenced to death. To put those numbers into perspective, the French historian Pierre Chenu noted, the French revolutionary government killed more people in one month in the name of atheism than the Inquisition did in the name of God throughout the entire Middle Ages. This is absolutely true, and yet today secularism is not as demonized as the Inquisition. It shouldn't be surprising that the number of executions during the Inquisition were as low as they're estimated. Executions of heretics were the last thing that Inquisitors actually wanted. An execution meant they failed at their job of rehabilitating the suspect's soul. The person being killed could also become a martyr for other heretical causes. It was thus in the moral, spiritual, and material interests of the church for suspects to simply recant of their heresy and not die. The Inquisition mostly sentenced people to a short amount of prison time, and gave religious penalties like requiring people to visit local churches. The majority of people investigated by the Inquisition were those who said things they didn't even know were heretical, and after being corrected, most accepted it and were allowed to go on their way. But what about torture? When was it used and how often? This is an area where urban legends have once again become more popular than fact. It's true that torture was sometimes used to obtain proof of accusations as well as confessions, but it was rare. It was used as a last resort and not thrown around willy-nilly. It was forbidden to be used as a punishment, and clergy were banned from personally engaging in torture. Nicholas Emmerich, author of the Inquisitor's Manual, criticized torture as being unreliable and prone to abuses, so Inquisitors were well aware of both the practical and moral drawbacks of torture. Inquisitor guidelines and handbooks demanded that strict evidence standards be applied before any torture was administered. Torture that was unnecessarily brutal or inflicted permanent injuries was outlawed, and a medical expert was required to be present at all times. Inquisitor manuals on torture were so ahead of their time that they have many similarities to modern-day guides for intelligence agencies and police departments. None of this makes torture a good thing, but it should be noted how the Inquisition found ways to make it a bit more humane. The civil authorities of Europe and the rest of the world were much more brutal by comparison. The legal practice of torture dated back to Roman times and was by no means unique to medieval Europe. The use of torture in Inquisitions was so much less extensive and so much less violent that many people preferred to be tried by Inquisition courts than by secular courts. And in case anyone thinks this was the clergy tyrannizing the public, that is totally wrong. The general public of the time period was often much harsher towards heretics than the actual clergy was. The public actually wanted harsher penalties for heretics and found the clergy too lenient. During medieval history, there were many mobs that lynched heretics before the clergy could even pass a sentence. In a way, it's understandable. People don't like when others spread views they believe will harm their society. 
We should next address arguments they claim Inquisitions are somehow anti-Christian. Some Christian denominations have attacked Catholicism for the Inquisitions, saying that the true Church of God wouldn't have them. The problem with this argument is that Inquisitions are very biblical. The Bible itself records times where God commanded formal, legal inquiries, that is, Inquisitions, to expose secret believers in false religions. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, God ordered the Israelites to inquire diligently into those transgressing his covenant and worshiping false gods. If the accusation was true, God ordered the guilty to be stoned to death. It's clear that even in the Bible there were Israelites who posed as keepers of the covenant of God while they secretly practiced false religions and even tried to spread them. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 6 states that Israelites who secretly try to spread false doctrines be resisted and punished. To protect the kingdom from such hidden heresy, these practitioners of false religions had to be rooted out and expelled from the community. The Bible says plainly, You must inquire, probe, and investigate it thoroughly. Like ancient Israel, medieval Europe was a society of kingdoms that were formally consecrated to God. So it's entirely understandable that these Catholics would read their Bibles and conclude that for the good of their Christian society, they, like the Israelites before them, must purge the evil from the midst of you. The Apostle Paul repeats this principle in 1 Corinthians 5.13. The first Protestants interpreted these verses the exact same way. They tried desperately to root out and punish those they saw as heretics. Martin Luther and John Calvin both endorsed the right of the state to protect society by purging false religion. And Orthodox Christians also did the same thing. There are many cases of the Orthodox Church giving strict penalties for heresy. I point all of this out to show that Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox all understood that the Bible requires the use of penal sanctions to root out false religion from Christian society. Any criticism of Catholic Inquisitions by other Christian denominations can also be directly applied to themselves. Religious tolerance as we understand it is a very modern idea, and it comes with its own problems, as you saw from some of the clips earlier in the video. I Expanding on those problems requires its own video. For example, in our modern secular society we have mass abortion, mass euthanasia, mass drug deaths. I could go on. Secularism as we currently understand it inherently benefits atheism because it forces the state to treat atheism as the default for society. It's thus no wonder that atheism has been rising for over a century and especially the last few decades. And today we see the many ways a society based on atheistic philosophical principles is at odds with one based on Christian philosophy. In the United States in 2020, there were 500,000 abortions. That's 100 times as many deaths as the Spanish Inquisition over 300 years. I've covered other negatives of the current system on this very channel, like the detransition horror stories of Reddit. Our modern society simply has no right to look down on past people. They lived significantly harder lives than us. Lives that most people today couldn't mentally or physically handle. And yet people today still often trump ancient people in immorality. Now, is this video meant to say that the Inquisition and Inquisitors were perfect people who never made mistakes? Absolutely not. Human beings are flawed, and there were sometimes abuses in the name of Inquisition. But many who use the Inquisition as an attack against Christianity aren't really interested in any of the facts. They simply don't like Christianity and want any excuse to demonize it. Even if there were abuses in the name of the Inquisition, it would in no way reduce the truth of the Christian religion. It simply shows that mankind's sinful nature is powerful. There are always problems in any human endeavor. We can certainly point out problems in our modern day criminal justice systems. But as a whole, the historical record shows that the Inquisition is unfairly demonized. It served as a necessary force for Christians to protect themselves from forces seeking to corrupt their religion from within and from without. Catholic societies with active Inquisitions were generally the ones that had the least heresy. At the end of the day, the Inquisition raised standards of justice, limited hysteria, and increased the rigor of criminal investigations. Because of its continuously improving methods over the centuries, the jurisdiction of Europe improved. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why the Inquisition was awesome indeed. This has been Pax, and thank you so much for watching. 
If you'd like to see more videos, please consider supporting the channel. Also, leave a comment letting me know your thoughts on everything. As always, I will see you in the next video.